Julie, I think this might be a good time to start the recording. Thank the, you. It, it is recorded, yeah. Thank you, I see that the recording started. All right, so welcome again for the Power BI for Healthcare um, third part. If you have not seen the other two parts, please feel free to look at um, them in the YouTube videos. Um, probably it will be in the description on uh, and or, or it will be also available on this particular channel. Uh, so the intended audience I've uh, briefly mentioned are BI developers, engineers, data engineers, and anybody in healthcare data analytics or even outside of healthcare because a lot of these approaches uh, will be helpful if you're using Power BI and some data strategy in material of the tool as well but this is more so focused for Power BI. Yeah. And we are part of SQL, STL SQL Server User Group and STL BI User Group. Um, I want to restart this for one sec. All right. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. So, uh, my intro, I've been, I'm sorry about this. This is from a prior one. I am now a BI lead uh, at SSM Health. Um, I have more than 11 years of experience for, uh, in BI. Uh, I've seen code server uh, over 10 plus years and SAP Crystal Reports 11 plus years, year and a half of Power BI experience, uh, almost two now. Um, Data modeling, I've done a ton of data warehousing, ETL, TLTs, sending data to external vendors, third-party billers, um, coders, or uh, government agencies for compliance, regulatory, reimbursements, and stuff like that, and also organizational compliance, so all kind of data modeling and for things like metadata. Uh, and things like that. Um, and a big clinical EMR. So I have a, I have like five, six EPIC certifications related to data models. Uh, and Cogito, uh, their proprietary data uh, database. Oh, like inpatient radiology lab stuff. So I'm, I've worked with those, um, those data, that, uh, those domains the data in those domains are very familiar. So that's my information. Um, again, um, I might have missed out of, I mean, if I have missed out of here, I'm sorry, but this is my major contributors to um, the Power BI knowledge that I've acquired. Uh, and also, I mean, there are a few for SQL Server, um, Microsoft Docs, Gynacube, SQL BI, Chris Webb's BI blog, B3 Consulting, and also Alex Powers, if you can put his name in. But yeah, these have these guys have been very helpful. Uh, these people have uh, helped a lot in my understanding of Power BI. Thank you so much. Power BI migration. Uh, so again, this is just a quick recap of what I spoke about. Uh, so Power BI migration, our migration is from some of these um, legacy tools like mainly SAP Suite and ClickView uh, into Power BI. So this Power BI, uh, of course, is more for aggregation, excuse me. But um, uh, we have used these prior tools in aggregated format or in a fashion that's almost like doing an ETL and giving a data dump to people. So 
uh, we're trying to move away from that and then just give aggregated insights, data analytics and insights only. Um, again, uh, that aggregation and insights, <laughs> one of our key things is to move away from more so like an Excel data dump, RCSD data dump to creating more insights within working with the end user and stuff like that. Again, this is one of the things that I've mentioned in the past too. Star schema is very important to create in the backend warehouse or Power BI. Uh, these are the methods that I, I spoke about in the past where you could implement that star schema. Uh, Power BI is a very capable tool. You can do the ETL in any in part within Power BI from from end to end. However, the ideal situation is what is on top. We create all the data warehousing and all the calculations in the source. So Power BI does um, data storage and um, UI, uh, which it does very good. So focusing on its strength. Again, um, the very last part of the recap is I mentioned some developer experience, some small tips on what would be very helpful for developers when they, uh, when they are designing a UI. I mean, there's the concept of you X with the user experience. So we focus a lot on that. That was very experience. Sometimes happens based on the standards and process that we do, but it's not thought about a lot. Um, so think about that whenever you're doing some of these items. So the next two things I'm gonna talk about, <clears throat> go a little bit with the developer experience as well. Um, so calculation groups and producing measures and toggles between relationships and limiting data and power BI desktop. Um, so first, let me do the smaller, simpler item, which is the Power BI desktop. How do Power BI desktop? How do I limit data? Because I know a lot of us, we have to develop um, our data sets. We use the source. We bring data in, and it's not just thousands of rows. It might be like millions of rows. Um, so when you use a source that's super, uh, it's very big, big data. How do you limit that, especially during development? Because uh, when I show my screen, I should be able to see. <clears throat> so in my um, Power BI data set, um, I'm going to go back into the query transformation. Um, so the method that I was initially using was a little bit helpful. However, it had its own limitations in a way. And then um, to expand on it, guy in a cube, I saw a video on that, and that small case statement helped, or if statement helped, change that experience itself totally different. So initially, I had uh, a table, let's say, with keep first rows. So you can see whenever I need to look only at a certain level of data, uh, let's say this table has millions of rows, all I would do um, is just keep rows and I would say keep the top rows. And then when I'm developing it, I might have like 100 rows or something show up. So I would say, okay, show me 100 rows. Um, so, or in this case, let me limit it to just 10. So you can see how it's only limiting to 10, which is a normal transformation, which is easy to have. So once I have this, all I was doing was the closing and applying, adding all the tables that I needed uh, in the same way when I have like really huge tables. And then I would go to my data model. Uh, I would do all the modeling. And then once I'm done, then I would publish it. So then I didn't 
I was not sure how to get rid of this once I published it into the survey. So then I just had a, um, uh, 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 sorry, a parameter that I would use in that instead of that keep 10 rows. So I would just add that parameter here. Uh, and then I believe it had some limitation to how many rows it can show. So I was hitting that problem too, because once I have this parameter and loaded it into the service, I could just go to the service and switch that parameter value. Um, so instead of zero, instead of 10 initially, I would just switch it to um, million, let's say. So then it's going to bring everything. Is that million? No. Million. So then it will bring million rows. However, again, like I said, it had some limitations. I think it might only show million. Beyond that, it was having some problems. Um, to again bypass that, the guy in a cube video was very helpful. And this simple switch um, was very helpful, where in my first flight set, you see keep first rows. So that is doing the same thing. It's finding the first n, which is using top n rows, which is the parameter. So if I said 100 rows, then it's going to say 100 rows. If I said zero rows, then there's going to be nothing really coming out of that. And then for that, my whatever prior step was, it was in this case, it's just selecting certain columns. That is my prior last ultimate step that I actually would have displayed if I did not do any of this um, restricting data. Um, so once I did that, I added this keep first row. Let me actually remove this second one. So it's not confusing. So this is, the, this is how much I wanna see. And then I added this keep first rows, but in this case I have zero. So ignore it for one second. And then in my final step, I'm just using that switch. I'm saying, in case if that value is zero, then pull everything from this prior step. Otherwise, just go to the keep first row step. So if it was more than zero, it would just like five, 10, 100, 1,000, million, doesn't matter. It would go and pull it from this row. Simple switch. All you have to do whenever you're doing the development, just do it as 100. Once you publish this to the service, again, this parameter will be available in the service, like any other parameter you can see. Um, and then you just go there and switch that parameter number to be zero instead of 100. Simple, easy. Um, and even better is, again, these are million, 100 million maybe, um, number of rows that you have in, this, in these tables. So instead of switching it the first time, you publish it to Power BI service with 100 rows. And then you refresh the data set. So the data set itself will have 100 rows with the partitions that you want. However, all the partitions might not be might not be there. Then um, all you do is change that parameter value in the service, not here. Uh, change this parameter value after the first refresh, 100 rows, change this to zero, uh, save it, and then go back to an API like SQL Server Management Studio, use the API, uh, connect to the SSAS cube, behind the scenes of Power BI service, refresh, do a full process partition, and then it will bring in all the data. Or if you have too much data, you can always partition one process at a time. So that way, initial loading is a lot easier and faster. Um, any questions on this? I don't see any questions at this time. Okay. Uh, feel free to put questions in the chat. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right. So that is one. Uh, next item is the is the calculation groups. So reducing measures, 
So if you guys know what calculation groups are, it's very helpful. Um, if you don't know what they are, uh, it's just a concept to have related measures in a bucket or a group. Um, so when we have measures in Power BI that are, um, let's say we have it, we could create a ton of measures um, that are like average. So you have a measure, you have a quantity of, uh, let, let's say sales item, your know, quantity of sales item, and then you see like um, you do an average over that, you do um, median, mean, all those are separate measures that you would have to create. Um, so if I had a measure, and instead of doing all those in separate phases, if I did them together using this group, um, reduces the number of measures that you would have to create and maintain, and you would have to otherwise, you know, see like, 10 measures, let's say that you're trying to do, or let's say there are like uh, five different uh, types of measures, four different um, uh, categories that you would have to otherwise be created this way. Calculation group can just fasten, fa uh, speed up this process. So what are calculation groups and how do, I, how do you do it is what I'm gonna focus now. Um, it's very simple. Uh, one of the key things you'd have to do uh, have at this time, at least as far as I know, is tabular editor. Um, so this helps in creation of uh, <clears throat> calculation groups. Um, actually, I would bring up my external tools and open up tabular editor. I don't want to yeah. All right, so this is tabular editor. Uh, you can see there are various parts of it. I'm not going to go too much into how to use tabular editor, but and it has everything about the model itself, like the relationships, roles, like the user roles that you create, the tables and shared expressions, so on and so forth. So you can basically model your entire data model instead of Power BI desktop. Uh, actually, not instead, I shouldn't say that, but you can start the data model there and uh, come here to finish it up too. Instead of limiting that data, if you use tabular editor, it helps you not have to look at the data and just create the modeling related items faster. Uh, so in this, um, in this um, uh, tabular editor, you can see within tables, I have the list of tables that I saw in my um, in my model and in my uh, list of tables. Um, so all I would have to do is add another calculation group. You can see I can add a calculation group directly. And you could open tabular editor by itself and then connect to your Power BI desktop data set. However, uh, one of the things I did whenever I went to that external tools into this, it already was connected. This makes it easier to connect your existing, whichever one you're working on, data set to the tabular editor, which is why when I opened tabular editor, it automatically came up with only the data, data set that I'm currently working on, the mo data model related to the data set I'm working on, and not a different one. So you can see it's coming from this PBIX file that I currently am have it open. Um, you can see, again, creating new calculation group is as simple as just clicking on this. And then I can, normally I would wanna call it something uh, underscore, so it goes on the top and then cal group. So I know it's a calculation group and then, uh, and then I do that, and then it creates a calculation group. I'm not gonna do, and then um, within the calculation group, you can see in here, it almost behaves like a 
uh, the one that I have here almost behaves like a table. So you see name is like a field in a table. So this is like a table and you can see, I can create items underneath it. So the calculation item, I can call whatever. Um, in this case, let's say, you know, core measure, uh, sorry, let's say post date. Um, sorry, you know, date one, let me call it date one. And then I can just call this selected measure. So if this is basically DAX that I'm writing here, and always for the default calculation item, I want to do a selected measure. All that means is this is the measure I'm looking at. That's what I want to see for this particular item. Um, and as I show you the results, you will be able to see it even further. <clears throat> and then I can just keep adding more and more items like that. Um, but the second one on, I have to like put something in relationship what, with my first item. So uh, instead of writing a new one, I'm gonna show you the one that I've already created for this particular case. Um, so in this case, I created one for a date that I currently have. And then a date, let's say I have a relationship that does this and automatically it switches this. So uh, in our data model, uh, one of the previous times, I mean, I have already created one that, ha that gets a date that is like 30 days from whatever date is normally in the data. Um, just to show this difference. So in case there are two separate dates that you wanna use and it's not this linear that they are connected to, like one might be a sales date, or sorry, one might be an order date and one might be a delivery date or something like that because they don't necessarily have to be linear. They might not be just like a 30 day difference in between standard, it might be something. So when you use this, <clears throat> one set of calculation items will be looking at either the order date and if you use the other one and it will use the relationship that's based on the delivery date. So in this case, again, you can see selected measure, it just means I'm look, looking for the default relationship, default measure. Um, and then if I am doing a related measure, like average, if I have like, a, quantity or something and I'm doing an average instead of use relationship, I would just have, you know, selected measure um, and I would do an average, uh, not even a calculator, and just average of selected measure. So then it would do an average or it would be a mean or median, whatever you're doing. <clears throat> In this case, I'm switching a relationship using this calculation group, which is a powerful thing. Um, which I kind of stumbled upon accidentally um, playing with it. Um, and then I realized SQL BI did a video on that too. So I knew it was not intended or it was not like a bad thing to do. So it's not illegal for me to do it that way. I'm not breaking anything under on the underlying structure. So it was very helpful. Um, so all I did was just switch the relationship uh, to instead of coming, the standard measure coming from a contact date, it is now going to come from contact date plus 30. Um, again, it's, this is basic DAX. Um, so now what happens is it creates that column. Now you can see that I, this is just called name. Now, if I wanted more descriptive, I can say based on whatever it is that I'm trying to do, it could be like an order. Oops. What is happening? Okay. Uh, instead of that, you do it here. So, order versus delivery date or something. So, you know, people who are looking at it know what that particular uh, thing is doing. They know what it is doing. And then when I save, before saving, I'll show you here. 
uh, right. So you see, this is having a name. So let me delete this group. So it's not um, updating that. But you see, I made a change to the name of this. And then right after I hit save, because it disconnected, it immediately does that change. And it says, you know, there are some pending things that are happening. Can you want to apply changes? When I apply changes, it changed. So it is very quick. It is. It happens right away. Whatever you make changes in the tabular literature, because your models are connected. Um, now, what does what does that mean? Uh, unfortunately, I broke something from that. As you can see, this particular visual, which is a bad thing. Normally, I wouldn't do that. Before I'm done with everything, I would set something up where I'm using it constantly. In this case, I just had used this as a slicer. So it shows me that date versus date P30. So the when I use that field in a slicer, what I see is the names that I have used in that calculation group. So what it's doing, as you can see, I have counts here. So when I switch, when I toggle, what it is doing is it's giving me some value now because it is working with the 30 days post data because um, I don't have data for, uh, for the regular data for this particular time frame. Um, I just set, that up, set it up that way so you can view the difference. But you can see that 30 days later, there are 82 items in my list. Um, when I go back, there are really no items in that list during that time frame. Excuse me, in this particular table uh, that I'm displaying the counts for. Uh, so it's very simple. When I'm doing this itself in the back end, what is happening is basically using the calculation group is using this and saying, what do I want? I want to count, I want to count the row so you can see. I just want to count the rows in Clarity EAPOT. So when I do that, that's the table where I added that P, um, date plus 30 or date. And I have the dates isolated here. Um, so Clarity APOT, you can see contact date has some value and then P30 and I've connected it to a date table um, on calendar date, where's calendar date right here. So you can see it's either contact date or contact date P30. So in this case, I for this particular toggle to work, I have to use an inactive relationship, which is how I can use it in the calculation group itself. So this is an extension of calculation group, how I'm using, but this will basically give you the concept of using calculation groups for multiple things. Um, so the active relationship is for calendar contact date and then contact date plus 30 is this inactive relationship. When I go back to my um, main measure, it's doing like count rows. I'm just trying to count the number of rows so I can show you the difference. And the calendar date, of course, is that is based on that particular date. When I switch this, then the calendar date is using the relationship for P plus, uh, for date plus 30. So there is, da there is uh, data for this time frame. So you see that it's showing me rows and this measure itself now has data as well when it's counting rows. That's how I found one. Now uh, this one, the count rows. Again, in the back end, this flip, this little flip is actually letting me do a data model change. It's trying to say use a particular relationship instead of this. So this could be used in multiple ways. One, again, to reduce the number of measures. Otherwise I would have had to create a measure for date and then another same row count measure for date plus 30. If I have like four 
such date columns. I would have like to create four, um, four measures for this one actual measure that I'm looking for. And if there are like five such measures, then it's five times four, or it, it becomes that many times. So and it becomes an end-time problem of whatever number of measures you have. Uh, fortunately for us, that is resolved by just using this calculation group switch. Any questions on how you create a calculation group and how it reduces the measure, number of measures and how you can use it in a visual? And normally if this was not for a, for a toggle relationship like this, um, you can use this as a part of a matrix or a table. Uh, this calculation group can be used as a part of a table or a matrix, actually more so matrix. Um, because then you can set the, co uh, the columns to be that. And then I don't know what I will do for rows. Um, I'll just try and do this. Um, since it doesn't have any value for the other one, it is not just throwing me an error. Let me do this. Okay. Change that. No data for that, too. Uh, only letting me choose one or the other. But you can kind of see. Um, in the case where I'm not using this toggle as well, because this toggle is enforcing only one item. Um, but if not for the toggle, what will happen is you will see two different columns, one with date and one with date 30. So you can see both of them at the same time for the measure. Um, again, sorry, any questions? Uh, no questions in the chat. All right. Um, all right, let me move on to the next one. All right, so I did the calculation groups, toggle relationships, toggle between relationships, you know, and then limiting the data in PBA desktop. So those again are part of developer experience. When you are able to use these, you're able to reduce the number of measures, be able to give the users some control over what they select and what they wanna see instead of us having to hard code all those options. Um, especially with the newer you know, bookmark navigator and page navigator, it's a lot more easier to use those. Um, next topic is, the RLS, OLS, and BLS. So I know I've spoken about BLS last time a little bit. Um, just a fun, um, quick show of what that would look like. Um, it's, it's a lot more simpler, so I'm gonna kind of skip that. Um, and then do RLS and OLS. So for us, <clears throat> um, I am not sure if I can show a very enhanced version of RLS. What I'm going to do is, what do we do for RLS? That's what I'm gonna tell you guys. Unfortunately, I can't do a very detailed demo because it does have some data and stuff like that. Um, so in here, if you see, we do have a table called role level security. We created that as a data flow. And what this table has is a list of items uh, from the AD groups. So admins within our system uh, for, okay, for healthcare in our system, the key role level security we need is to identify what user groups need access to what locations. Because we have multiple uh, hospitals, multiple clinic groups, and some affiliates. 
who cannot view our data, our wholly owned data. Excuse me. So <clears throat> to identify and let all the users see just one dashboard, but restricted to only their location, like their hospital, their ministry. That is where we are using this role of security. Um, so in this case, for the role of security itself, um, in within Azure AD groups, our admins create AD groups specific to workspaces and specific to those locations for a user. Um, so if a user gets access to a list of locations, they would have that access for that particular work for all the workspaces. Um, so if I gave Julie access to one of the affiliates, it would be available for all, within the, all the workspaces at this time. However, uh, you know you could do this however you want. You can have a uh, user per uh, workspace per uh, per re region or location or whatever kind of place that you're trying to show them the data to. Um, usually, our it's pretty. Uh, how you enable it itself is pretty simple. We have this, you know, role of security, like I said. Uh, let me see. There any data dimension clarity look? Okay, there shouldn't be any other data that I should be worried about. Yeah, role of security just has, has a list of people's name, and uh, um, it has the DLs and that they're a part of, and then the uh, you know, the location IDs that we have. So um, whoever gets access to that is all we see here. Um, so this table is what we use to connect in our model to one of the fact tables. Currently here, I don't have any, do not have any fact tables, but let's say my location table itself is the fact table, then I would just do a, uh, do a join to that particular table on that particular value that I'm looking for. And I would filter it based on that. So apply that filter security settings figure in both directions. So this way, whenever you get that, it restricts to particularly that user having access to whatever region or location in our case. Um, to enable this again, uh, what we have to do is uh, go to manage role, uh, sorry, manage roles. And then, so we created a role called RLS <clears throat> security role. Uh, it is on this particular table that I showed you a minute ago. And then I'm just trying to have that user principle that I brought in as the user principle that I see on Power BI service. So just a simple DAX expression so in Power BI service, what this will do is it'll filter who I am that is directly connected to the model. So who I am is connected to the model using this DAX expression. Um, and this table has what locations I have access to that I can only see. So this DAX expression also filters out what I can see in this entire data model by this. Um, so that is our, our uh, role of security. And of course you can, you can, if I show us like a different person, um, where we go? view as if I'm viewing as someone else, uh, if I'm doing a different user, say Joe Smith, I don't know if there's Joe Smith, just our uh, Jane Doe, John Doe. That's the regular one, isn't it? At ssmhealth.com, if I do that, then it's gonna switch it up and find if there is a John Doe, if not, and even if there is, I mean, you'll see if it is, 
if there's any data that the person can or cannot see. And I was not hoping it would take this long. Mm. Go on, John. Okay. All right. So you can see that I cannot see the sensitive information. It just wiped it out. Um, and of course, this is not connected to the entire model itself. Um, so some parts of it I can still see because I did not restrict those items. So I, the John person can see the entire list of location names and everything. Um, however, again, um, if I took that out, because it is applying that stuff. Oh, sorry. And then I'm just viewing as myself again. I should be able to see everything that was here. That is RLS. Um, and really quickly, again, um, for visual level security, again, this is a little bit more intense on the performance itself. So I wouldn't necessarily do this, but this is still an option if you have to use it, like I did on this one. I don't know if you saw a minute ago with that John, John Doe, that all of these became like a lock. That item is alone restricted for that person. So in a case like that, you can see my code. Code itself does that. Uh, again, like I said, it's a, it's a performance intensive one. So. Um, based on the user security that I have coded here, um, the same thing, if it is a part of that user security, if I am a part of that user security group, then I'm looking at the unit, uh, that whatever value. So weights is that CPT code. I'm just showing a list of CPT codes here. Um, and then, if that person does is not a part of this group, then I will see that lock symbol. That's the unit car one two eight two seven four. Just randomly picked one, uh, but you can see when that happens. Um, again, um, if I just say, then, all right, not wait. Oh, well, let me switch these. That'll be easier. So you can see how for me as well, it's gonna restrict it. And it'll show that particular lock. So I can't see that information anymore. This is visual level restriction security. So you, that person can still see things, but if there's only like one field that that person cannot see, then uh, this is how I'm doing it for it to be a little bit more visually pleasing and still the thing not breaking. Um, however, since I said about a, a particular field, I'll go to object level security. Uh, before that, any question about role level security and visual level security? All right, I'll move on to the next one. So uh, the same thing there is in the, um, or the object level security, we use the same tabular chair, which is very essential again. So we have used that twice in a row now. So we'll think about it, very helpful. So when I go back to the tabular chair, I have open, otherwise you know how to get to it. Um, so, when I look at a table like this, and you can see the properties of the table here, this is where object level security is coming to some kind of use. And why or what we're gonna use to object level security. Let me go back and say initially why we need it. So let's say John, <clears throat> is financial, and you can see on my screen, John is financial, Joe is clinical, and Jane is leader. 
um, so John and Joe see only their type of data, financial and clinical data. Jane sees everything, uh, mostly, hopefully, only aggregated information um, from our prior conversation. You can see that you know, fact one is holds clinical data. Fact two holds financial data. And a lot of times we have to merge different kinds of data in same, the same model to unlock multiple levels of insights. And so some people might only have access to clinical data or they should only see clinical data. Excuse me. And some people would only see like financial data. So in this case, you can see the screen. It's all like clinical. So these are clinical tables and the financial is this yellow or whatever color that is. John is financial, Joe is clinical, you can see. Labeled it easily for you to understand. So what I would do in that case is make sure John has access to only financial data. So give him permissions to read everything from fact two and not from fact one. Jane is a leader, so she gets access to both. Joe is a clinical guy, so he sees like only the clinical data, not the financial one. Um, there might be HR data and stuff like that, so you know, you can apply this to any level. So that's what we're trying to do to object level security. In this case, at the table level, I'm trying to disable permissions, but uh, I am not doing this on the database because in the database, if you do it, once it comes to Power BI, Power BI doesn't necessarily use that same permission that you have set in the database. So if you have a source database, these people might have this, these permissions, but that doesn't carry over to Power BI. We have to re-enable it. Um, we have to enable it manually in Power BI. So to do that, again, going back to tabular literature, the properties of each of the tables, you can see that there's something called role level security. So if we enable role level security, you would see that here. However, see this one on the top, object level security. So ideally, you would want to, instead of doing John, Joe, Jane, and all, you would want to give it to a user group. So like I just created that RLS user in my modeling view. So again, if you don't know how to create a user um, in the Power BI, it's very simple. Just go to modeling view. You should be able to do it quickly. And once you create a user, assign that user that um, security so you know what is happening. In this case, it is default. Default is read, I could. So in case if RLS represents a person who wants to see financial data only, and this is not a financial table, then I will switch it to none. So I explicitly say RLS, they shouldn't see it. Or to make a little bit more sense what I'll do, is I will create two other uh, roles, but they won't really have any use in here. Okay, so I'm just gonna, it's like a dummy role, financial. So the back end, when I go to Power BI service, I will use them appropriately, clinical. All right, so I've created those two roles. That's all how you create roles and then save it. Now let me go back to, yes. So you can see that object level security now has the clinical and financial users in it. Now I would have to put the right people within that group. Um, that is a different thing again. Uh, however, I can say this is only for clinical, uh, this is a clinical table. So I want clinical people to only read. Financial people cannot read it. I would do the same for a different one. 
So either when it's default, they can they can definitely read it. By default, it is read. Otherwise, it's a none. Or I can set in the rows what that row can do and say they cannot read anything. If I said none, then that means a person cannot do anything. It cannot read anything at all from the data model. <clears throat> or by default, it is read. Um, so where was it? where was I here? Go back instead of the roles going into the table. Oh, sorry. Okay, I'll go back to the roles just for another quick glance at it. So if I want to give model permission, go here. If I want to switch it to read from read to something else, then I can do that here, or I can even set the table level permissions here. If I want to do it all at a time, I can just do it read, say the OT is the financial one, the financial table. So I'm letting them read that. And then the rest are read, because you see the farthest read. So multiple ways of doing it, but the same thing applies. Making sure somebody can see data from that or not. <clears throat> now, um, there is a none. Let me actually switch this to none. Okay, and then clinic well, to read. So I do not have anything for these users. Let me save this. Read, read. Okay. So I've saved those permissions. Now let me go back. So if I view as one of those roles, uh, I don't know which one I enabled. Uh, so one of this is gonna be able to view, or I guess I disabled this one. So that's the financial. When I do financial, you see it tells me I cannot see anything because I disabled it. <clears throat> and this is the one small issue with it. So if somebody, if you take away an object level security and you have it in the visual, then it gives that person this error. So then they can see that they don't have access to something of this. This might not mean anything to the user. However, which is, this is where the visual level security is very useful that I showed you. Less performant, but if you want to keep parts of a visual available for the user to see, just not one or two fields, then you can turn it off like this. Um, however, having said this, let me clear this out. Also, the other thing is, in here, I spoke about object level security for a table, but I can also do that at this level, uh, where, where did it go? Uh, object level security. So you can see that if I go into a particular table and I see, uh, let me choose a different, uh, un, not much, uh, wait, uh, CBD code is the used one. This is a used column. So if I see this, or maybe this one, uh, yeah, this is the used column. So I will be able to see the impact there right away. So if I go to this particular column and I select the property, I look at the properties and then the object of security into the table, I'm looking at the column and I can do the same. So again, remember um, the default behavior is read. So I'm switching it to uh, clinical, uh, yeah. We'll, uh, yeah, let's do clinical or yeah, clinical nut. And then I'm gonna just update it. And this is the one that uses it. Refresh, okay. Which one is it? Okay, 
right we have the r that is the right one okay so now if i go back and view a clinical i should have been able to see it uh, however the cpd code is gone again so i have only filtered that particular field still the same error they see um you see that something is wrong the model is not going to give you very detailed information that we don't have access to see only one item but um, again this is where visual level security really probably the least the last thing you want to do but if you want to give the end users an option to see that that particular field is not what not they're able to see and then and then you can decide if that particular, I mean, that person can come and ask, why am I not able to see this particular field? And you can tell them you don't have access to it. Uh, instead of them not knowing or them thinking that it is not working for some reason, your dashboard itself. Any question on role of the security, object level security at the table and column level and visual level security. So I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. Awesome. Um, you know, feel free to write in the chat or raise your hand and, and we can unmute you. I feel like the, these might be simpler concepts that people are already using. So um, they might be, they might not have many questions or I'm hoping this is helping or you guys want to try it out. Whenever you're trying it out, you can have this video by you and do the same steps that I showed you. Thanks, Julie. Let me move on to the next one. So Power BI implementation, um, uh, this is more like an overview. I'm not gonna go too much in detail. Um, just a few things that we did, you know, when we got the new BI tool, we had to get acquainted to that tool. We had to take time and make sure we understood a lot about it. In this particular case, we were moving from the bar, from a legacy tool, from a set of legacy tools to Power BI. So we had some um, training, which was helpful from our training partners um, before DAX and also um, um, there are some pre um, far behind a day um, a dashboard in a day videos on youtube too i think so those kind of helped us kick start them and then uh, we got to go through i mean a ton of documentation microsoft docs have everything there um, and sometimes you know it's hard to go through that so i always like uh beat the text just very helpful and then like a fast beat so it's easier for me to not having to go through that and just uh listen to it more uh because i'm gonna probably an auditory uh listener uh listener so um something like that um any other uh, any other uh, resources like i mentioned before like guy in a cube they're a great resource, SQL BI. They're a wonderful resource. Um, uh, there are like community user groups for Power BI too, that does a very good job. Um, um, and then identifying what the strengths and opportunities are. So if there is a good opportunity, we would submit an idea to Microsoft. <laughs> yeah. Perfect strength that is different from the existing tool mainly to we'll try to leverage that. Um, and then uh, user needs. One of the things, again, like I mentioned previously, we had gone from users who we would give them like a ton of detailed transactional level data, um, hundreds of thousands of rows, they would or to CSV, Excel, and do some stuff on top of it, trying to change, ask them more questions of how we can 
give them that solution. Um, even though this is a part of the implementation, we're doing something else as well on this, on top of this. So identifying the user needs, giving them the aggregated data, so they don't, they can uh, have their, have aggregated insights and analytics instead of having to do all this manual work. Me, um, behind. BI tool guidelines of practice, um, best practices. So after you know, learning about the tool, going through what you know, how we can like organize the users, how we can um, group them in domains and put them in, you know, identify their needs and cater to that appropriately. Uh, we came up with some guidelines and best practices or how we implement our Power BI, how, how we set up our workspaces, what kind of user security we have, like what kind of roles, how we're gonna do that Azure AD groups and um, what we're gonna do. Uh, again, one of the key things uh, for the role of security I, I wanna mention, you could do that Azure AD or if you have a, any other method already existing for the role of security also would work uh, if you have it in a config or uh, or an existing table it's a lot easier than to hard code it every time so um can remove as much as hard coding and calculation and put it on the source um star schema uh, all those kind of guidelines, best practices from all those documents and everything. And the user needs, we we wrote it down, came up with it. And then we did a rule, uh, we are doing a phased appro approach. So we keep picking up uh, picking up the, the analytic dashboards and reports that we have done, the prior tools, uh, switch it out. Uh, based on the priorities um, and say, okay, these are, I mean, those are a little bit more of the leadership calls and they understand the priority and, you know, how the agile dictates how it works for the, this approach too. Um, but then we roll it out slowly and steadily within the organization. Um, and I do want to say that strategy itself has helped us to go to Power BI because we do work with ADF and, you know, we have some Python notebooks that uh, we, you know, have within uh, Azure Databricks um, that we use to put that information, in, uh, the Python notebooks from the jobs, and then um, we bring data into the data lake uh, either use Python or SQL notebooks to move between the layers within the data lake and then aggregate it to Power BI. So this before process that is more streamlined and understanding the needs and the strengths and um, strengths and the opportunities for Power BI and what Power BI works well with understanding that using those when we create the data lake and the gold layer for our final you know, lake house, it's very helpful too. So again, going back to this piece, when we use that best practices, when we understand those, when we understand the guidelines, when we understand what, how we can be more efficient within Power BI service has helped us identifying how we can create the lake house and keep that star schema and everything. Uh, pretty tight. Um, a few things to um, to keep an eye out on, you know, analytics focused, like I mentioned before, dashboards, create dashboards, not exportable. I mean, you don't really want to keep that as your main goal. Have something really specialized, targeted insights. So, and as long as it's clear and simple for the end user to understand, just have some key insights for, for, the, for your dashboards, have the related 
data and their insights in the same page. And you could draw a story like a movie, like multiple scenes of a movie with multiple pages. So think of it that way, or yeah, if it's uh, sometimes, you know, multiple dashboards could be related to just like, you know, how Marvel movies are interconnected. So um, um, have that simple in a dashboard. And so it's easier to, for people to use that insights and go to a different place if they need to. Uh, use the correct graphical and tabular methods using line graphs uh, in the right place instead of uh, a bar graph uh, for trends and stuff like that, and you know so on and so forth. So easier to understand, more standardized that way. Uh, the same thing with standardization when, when I'm talking about colors and context. So keep it in the same context and use similar colors for those contexts so that in one place, um, green doesn't mean better and another place doesn't mean like worse or it's, that's a simpler example, but you know, it could be any color for that matter. So it's, it has a theme and you don't lose the focus of that context. Um, and I think, um, before I put, I mean, after I put this up, I realized, um, I saw there was another person a couple of uh, meetings ago who have done something about the uh, PowerShell, as our Power BI, REST APIs. Um, so I was gonna say these might be the future topics that I might do if people are interested. Um, Cause I created some uh, PowerShell scripts and I run it for, you know, like activity log or like the dashboard data set information um, and store that from the service into the into tables within the SQL Server database. Um, this way we can keep that metadata used for various purposes, uh, especially identifying schema drift in the source or uh, managing the source uh, schema drifts and how how do we approach schema evolution? Um, so those might be some future topics if there's interest. Uh, please let me know. Um, and any questions otherwise? So Daniel just really wanted to uh, praise you. Uh, he says, lovely, in my case, there are so many pri priceless tips that he did not know about. I will need to watch the webinar again. Thanks for being so detailed while showing step-by-step -step processes for each tip. And then he also mentioned, um, he said that you had mentioned a few videos and articles showing how to use Power BI and could you, uh, I, I don't know, remember if that was on a slide, but if you could list them here or on the YouTube, we could maybe put that in the description. Sure. Um, again, it's more so channels. Uh, so Guy in a Cube is a YouTube channel um, and SQL BI is a YouTube channel. Uh, maybe at the end of this meeting, I could post it on um, somewhere here. Um, they're, they're pretty helpful. Um, uh sql here let me go to this so when we post this slide itself um slide deck itself these have the links to those chat uh those channels um so when you see this slide deck you should be able to click on it and it'll take you to that channel and then you can browse their videos and see uh, the relevant information, or in this case, this blog. So, got a cube and SQL BI. Thank you so much, Daniel, for your uh, detailed feedback. That was very helpful. It's always a good fuel for us to do more content like this.
Um, Does anybody else have any other questions? All right, let's uh, pause the recording or stop the recording, if not. Okay, I'll, I'll take care of that.